and crucially, the thing that makes us significant is that the, uh, it's not just stochastically predicting right. the next token of like words or whatever, because it's like learned that like uh, a Sally corresponds to murder at the end right. of a Sherlock Holmes story. No, like if there is some shared thing between code and language, it must be at a deeper level that the model has learned. Yeah, I think we have a lot of evidence that actual reasoning is occurring right. in these models and that like they're not just stochastic parrots. Yeah. Um, yeah. It just feels very hard for me to believe that having yeah. worked and played with these models. Yeah. But I, I feel, like, normies who will listen will be like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, was, yeah my, my two like immediate cached responses to this are one, the work on Othello and now other games where it's like, I give you a sequence of moves in the game and it turns out if you apply some like pretty straightforward interpretability techniques, then you can get a board yeah. that the model has learned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's never seen the game board before anything, right? right? Like that's generalization. The other is Anthropic's influence functions paper um, that came out last year where they look at uh, the model outputs, like, please don't turn me off. I want to be helpful. <laughs> and then they scan like what was the data that led to that. And like one of the data points that was very influential was someone uh, dying of dehydration in the desert and like having like a will to keep surviving. Um, and, and to me, that just seems like very clear uh, generalization of, of motive rather than regurgitating, uh, don't turn me off. I think um, 2001 A Space Odyssey was also one of the influential things. And so that's, that's more related, but it's clearly pulling in things from, from lots of different distributions. And I also like the evidence that you see even with like very small transformers where you can explicitly encode circuits to like do addition, yeah. right? Like yeah. mod or induction like, heads. Or induction or, heads, yeah. this kind of thing. Like you can literally encode basic reasoning processes in the models manually. Um, and it seems clear that there's evidence that they also learn this automatically because you can then rediscover those from trained models. Yeah. To me, this is yeah. pretty strong. The models are underparameterized. Yeah, they need to learn. They were, we're asking them to do and a very hard to task. Learn. <laughs> and they want to learn. The gradients want to flow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so they need to, they're learning yeah. more, more general skills. Yeah. I know some skeptics are saying, nah, they're just overhyped stochastic parrots that lack a model of the world but they clearly have a representation of the world. In fact, we recently found that Llama 2 even has a literal map of the world in it. And AI also builds geometric representations of more abstract concepts, like what it thinks is true and false. There's this popular stochastic parrot's view that they are literally a mass of statistical correlations meshed together with no underlying structure. Um, the reason I think there's any hope whatsoever on, on a theoretical basis is that, ultimately, they are made of linear algebra, and they are being trained to perform some tasks. And my intuition is that for many tasks, the way to perform well on them is to learn some actual algorithms and, like, actual structured processes that maybe from a certain perspective you could consider reasoning. And... Models have lots of constraints, like they need to fit it into these matrices, they need to represent things using the attention mechanism and jellies and a transformer, and there's all kind of properties of this structure that constrain the algorithms and processes that can be expressed, and these give us all kinds of hooks we can use to get in and understand what's going on. So that's a theoretical argument. All theoretical arguments are bullshit, unless you have empirics behind it. And... We're going to talk a bunch throughout this podcast about the different bit of different preliminary results we have that make me feel like there's something here that can be understood. Uh, one I find particularly inspiring is this work I did reverse engineering modular addition, which I think we'll get to shortly. Um, in modular addition, there were just two one hot encoded inputs between 0 and 113, which is the modulo I used. Uh, yeah, the model has a fixed modulo. It's not doing modular addition in general. And there's just like 12,000 inputs, and it learns to do all of them. And in, I don't know, behaviorally, you can't even tell the difference between the model memorizes everything and the model learns some true algorithm. Though with the more cognitivist mechanistic approach, I can just look at it and say, yep, that's an algorithm. It's great. Not a stochastic parrot. Conclusively disproved that hypothesis. Um, and yeah. I think that for language models, it's more interesting because 
I uh, know, GPD-2, it's got a thousand tokens, 50,000 vocab, it's like 50,000 to the power of a thousand possible inputs. And there's a surprising amount of interesting algorithmic generalization. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk later about induction heads, which is this circuit language models learn to detect and continue repeated text. Like if given the word Neil, you want to know what comes next. Unfortunately, Nanda is not that high on the list yet. Um, <laughs> but if Neil Nanda has come up like five times before in the text, Nanda is pretty likely to come next. And um, this transfers to, if you get the model, just random tokens with some repetition, the model can predict the repeated random tokens because the induction heads are just a real algorithm. And the space of possible repeated random tokens is like enormous. It's like, in some sense, much larger than the space of possible language. Mm -hmm. And is this algorithmic generalization? I don't really know. It depends on your perspective. Let's bring in uh, this paper by uh, Bilal uh, Chug Chugtai. So it was called um, A Toy Model of Universality, uh, Reverse Engineering How Neural Networks Learn Group Operations. And you supervised that paper. And he was asking the question of whether neural networks learn universal solutions or these idiosyncratic ones. And he said he found inherent randomness, but models could consistently learn group composition via an interpretable representation theory. So can you give us a quick tour de force of that work? Yeah. Maybe I should detour back to my grokking work and just explain the algorithm we found there and how we know it's the real algorithm. Yeah, sure. Which is a good foundation for this paper. Sure, sure. Yeah, so... We found this thing we call the Fourier multiplication algorithm. The very high level, it composes rotations. Um, you can actually look at how the different bits of the model implement the algorithm and often just read this off. So the embeddings are just a lookup table mapping the one hot encoded inputs to these trig terms, sines and cosines of different frequencies. You can just read this off the embedding weights. Um, note, people often think that learning sine and cosine is hard. It's actually very easy because you only need it on 113 different data points, so just a lookup table. The model then uses the attention and MLPs to do this composition, to do the multiplication with triggered entities to get the like um, composed rotation, the A plus B terms, and here, we can just read off the neurons that they have learned these terms and that they were not there beforehand. The model is using its nonlinearities in interesting ways to do this. Um, it's also incredibly cursed because ReLUs are not designed to multiply two different inputs, uh, but it turns out they can if you have enough of them and it's sufficiently cursed. Um, and yeah, we can just read this off the neurons. Uh, also, if you just plot anything inside the model, it's beautiful and it's so periodic and I love it. Is there more to these algorithms than mindless copy? Raphael said that some large pre-trained models are trained exclusively on text. In just a few years, these models have shown an uncanny ability to write coherent paragraphs, explain jokes, and even solve math problems. He went on. Emily Bender, Timnit Gabru, and colleagues compared language models to stochastic parrots, alleging that they haphazardly stitched together samples from their training data. Parrots repeat phrases without understanding what they mean. Raphael said that ongoing debates about whether large pre-trained models understand text and images are complicated by the fact that scientists and philosophers themselves disagree about the nature of linguistic and visual understanding. Have you ever wondered how large pre-trained models are able to produce such impressive outputs? Many assume that these models simply memorize sequences from their training data, but there's ample evidence to suggest that this is not the case. In fact, these models are capable of producing novel sentences and images that were never seen before. Now, um, I guess I'm just going to hit you straight with the killer question. Do you think they are stochastic parrots, or do you think at this point it's a gross trivialization to say so? So just for contextualization, you're referring to the stochastic parts phrase, which uh, came out of uh, this, this paper by Emily Bender and colleagues. Um, 
and to some extent elaborate some ideas that were already uh, expressed in a previous paper by by Bender and Kohler, uh, climbing towards an LU, uh, in which they suggested that um, large language models cannot learn anything about meaning, uh, and uh, essentially what they're doing is just parroting uh, uh, the strings of text in the training data, so they're haphazardly stitching together uh, bits from the training data, as uh, they put it in the stochastic parts paper. I do not think that's a fair characterization of language models, as you, as you probably know. Um, reducing uh, language models to stochastic parity is problematic because you can probably show that uh, what they do is not just memorization, it's not just stitching together samples from the training data. Uh, uh, it's fairly, actually, fairly easy to show that they can pro produce novel outputs. Um, and uh, I also think that um, it's not quite right to uh, make a differentiatory statement on the basis of the claim that they only do next word prediction, for example, or people say sometimes they just do autocomplete. Well, it's true, the, the, the learning objective is next word prediction, right? Of course, uh, they learn this uh, uh, joint statistical distribution of the words, but uh, we shouldn't confuse the learning objective with whatever processing is happening inside the network to achieve that objective, uh, specifically the computations that are induced during training in order to reach that objective. So what I'm more interested in is finding more about these computations and uh, thinking about how they might relate to the kinds of computations we can ascribe to uh, humans, or perhaps not human animals, but they engage in various cognitive capacities like reasoning or, or planning or thinking or understanding. Traditional AI classifications such as agents, oracles, and tools fall short in capturing GPT's essence. Janus proposes a novel perspective, GPT as a simulator. This innovative metaphor reframes GPT as a universe simulator capable of crafting countless textual realities. Janus offers some key insights that challenge our assumptions and pave the way for a deeper understanding of GPT. You know, it, it just comes down to um, language models can write stories involving multiple characters, so clearly they can simulate multiple agents at any given point. And clearly, um, if the characters that it's generating are consistent, it can represent concurrent world models at any given point. There's been a lot of work recently like um, from uh, like Steinhardt and, and those folks at like Berkeley on like uh, trying to figure out like, what language models actually know versus what they say. Like, like where, where is like the distinction between uh, their internal knowledge and the, the things that they output? And regardless of what your prompt is, the, the, the internal representations are, are relatively robust. Even, um, even when trying to adversarially, uh, prompt. And I think that that leads to perhaps some evidence that, that, um, they don't simulate, uh, at least internally, this entire training distribution. They, they, they have perhaps a few, a number of core agents um that they simulate and, and then the rest kind of falls out from those right they, they, they have perhaps uh a few dozen core simulations that that can go on at any given point and these core simulations can be composed into a number of of different uh priors and and from those priors that they, 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 they express beliefs so the way to think about it is that when we train a large neural network to accurately predict the next word mm -hmm. in lots of different texts from the internet. What we are doing is that we are learning a world model. It looks like we are learning this. It may, it may look on the surface that we are just learning statistical correlations in text. But it turns out that to just learn the statistical correlations in text, to compress them really well, what the neural network learns is some representation of the process that produced the text. This text is actually a projection of the world. There is a world out there and it has a projection on this text. And so what the neural network is learning is more and more aspects of the world, of people, of the human conditions, their, their, their hopes, dreams and motivations their interactions and the situations that we are in, 
and the neural network learns a compressed, abstract, usable representation of that. Mm -hmm. This is what's being learned from accurately predicting the next word. And furthermore, the more accurate you are at predicting the next word, the higher the fidelity, the more resolution you get in this process. So that's what the pre-training mm -hmm. stage does. There are interesting interpretability pieces where if we fine tune on math problems, the model just gets better at entity recognition. Whoa, no, right. really? What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So, so there's like a, a paper from David Bao's lab recently where they yeah. investigate um, what actually changes in a model when I yeah. fine tune it with respect to the attention heads wow, and these sorts of things. And um, they have this like synthetic problem of um, box A has this object in it, yeah, box yeah, B yeah. has this other object in it. Um, what was in this Whoa. box? And, oh. and if you've tr and it makes sense, right? It's like uh, you, you're, you're, you're like, better at like attending to the yeah. positions of different things which you need for like coding and manipulating math equations. And um, I love this kind of research. Whoa. Yeah. What's the name of the paper? Do you know? It? Um, if, you if you look up like fine tuning math uh, models, math, yeah. David Bow's group okay, that came cool. out like a week ago. Okay. Um, I am and I'm not. Get I'm not endorsing the paper. Um, that's like a longer conversation. But okay. like this. Uh, it does talk about and cite other work on this like entity recognition ability. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned to me a long time ago is the evidence that when you train LLMs on code, they get better at reasoning and language, yeah. which unless it's the case that the comments in the code are just really high quality tokens or something implies that to be able to think through how to code better, like it makes you like a better reasoner. And like, like that's crazy, right? Like I think that's like one of the strongest pieces of evidence for like scaling, just making the thing smart. Like yeah, that uh, kind of like positive transfer. I, I think like this is this is true in two senses. One is just that modeling code obviously implies modeling a difficult reasoning process used right. to create it. But two, that code is a nice explicit like structure uh, of like composed reasoning. I guess yeah. like if this, then that. Like uh, encodes a lot of structure in that way. Um, um, yeah, that you could imagine transferring to other types of types of reasoning problems.